I think it was really uh, touching for me to uh, listen to the, uh, uh, the opening that uh, Jay had with the scriptures and the idea of the Lord's return. Also what, the, what Dan shared with us too. Uh, it's, it never ceases to amaze me how God will coordinate uh, the thoughts and the themes, uh, especially on a Sunday morning. Uh, today we're going to have another Sunday as we take a look at uh, the second coming of Christ. Uh, but before that, actually the rapture of the church. Since we've started Revelation, we're going to, I suppose, really be taking a look uh, for the next few years at the end times. And which is so important as we look to our, um, our vision statement. Our mission statement is to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, uh, to teach them as Jesus taught. But also our, our vision statement is the way how you know, we do this as a particular type of people with our dynamic, our personalities as a congregation. And so the idea of sharing the good news and then our lives and what helps us to share our lives together the way we should in Christ is staying focused on our lives to come and what the Lord's going to do as he comes and returns for us. So what we're going to do is we'll take a look at um, uh, Matthew chapter 24, what's called the Olivet Discourse. Uh, usually as a combination of Matthew 24 and 25, but we're going to take a look at uh, the concept of the second coming, but also we're going to take a look at the concept of the rapture, where the church does not go through wrath. It does not go through uh, the day of the Lord, so to speak, of uh, the age to come where the Lord returns uh, in, in, in the wrath of God. So, in Matthew chapter 24, we read that Jesus had left the temple in his earthly ministry, was walking away from his disciple, with his disciples, uh, and they came up uh, to the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to his disciples, he said, uh, Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Which prompted the question by the disciples in Matthew 24, verse 3, which we'll take a look at. So as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, and thus the Olivet Discourse, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? You know, no stone will be you know, left uh, uh, left standing up, and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And again, I think it's important that we understand that uh, they thought that the kingdom of God was immediate, because he, if this is the Messiah, he's here now, so you bring it on. And so they're asking this question. When, when is the sign of your coming where it's really going to hit the fan at, at the end of the age? And again, a reminder, the disciples had no idea that there would be the church, as we know it today, founded, started in uh, Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. This is before the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension, any of this. So they're inquiring about his ret return and restoring Israel back to her, to her prominence and punishing the world, punishing unbelievers, the second coming. We, we call it the second coming. And so what Jesus does to explain this, he starts talking about uh, making comparisons. And I believe this comparison uh, that he's going to show us, going back to the, the time of Noah and his days, I think what we're going to be able to take away that before the flood, that there was a preview, a preview of the rapture. A preview before that catac cataclysmic event of the flood. So as Jesus uh, talks about the, uh, his coming, he says, as he's in verse 36, let me back up, go back here one time and just read this. Jesus says in verse 36, about, about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And then Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. The end of the age. Answering their question, so to speak. The day of the Lord. And so Jesus uses this catastrophe. Actually, the word, we get the word uh, um, catastrophe from this. Catalusis is the word. To illustrate, to illustrate this, this flood that came, this, this judgment on the world. And taking a look at the attitude of those in Noah's days and the attitude of people today before the Lord returns in the second coming, the end of the age. So in chapter 24, uh, leading up to these statements, 
Uh, Jesus is saying there will be many false claims. People will say, I'm the Messiah. No, I'm the Messiah. I'm at Bailey's. I'm, you know, Jesus is waiting for you at the Walmart in Plymouth. You know, you, you name it. There will be international conflicts. There will be national disasters. There will be famine. There will be earthquakes. And all this is just the first of contractions or birth pains. There will be the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, and towards the end, the cosmos will be plunged into darkness. The heavens will roll up like a scroll. The stars will shrivel up like figs. And this is how the prophet Isaiah described it. Jesus is using the same language. With the judgment of the nations. He was repeating the awesome words from Isaiah 13 and 34. And so now we're up to verse 36. And Jesus is talking about Noah and his family as a picture. The flood as a picture of how the mirac there was a, a miraculous saving of Noah and his family. But there was also a great punishment and judgment on the world. And how this will also be during the tribulation before his return. But the church is taken up before this. So Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. Now, we need to keep this in mind. He's making this comparison. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. In those days, people were consumers. <laughs> Are we consumers today? We know how that is. Don't we get, we get busy with things, don't we? In fact, for those of us who might be a little older, didn't we think things were going to get easier? Yeah. We're busier. We didn't think that was possible. So in those days, people were consuming. They were too busy to, to bother about what was being said. I believe that, uh, that uh, Noah was a preacher of righteousness, we were told, in the old world. So people were consuming while the ark was being built on dry land. I'm sure it raised some questions. And I believe Noah, at those that asked, Noah said, I'm building an ark. And people said, that's great. What's an ark? What's well, protect us from the flood? What's a flood? You know, Great opportunity to talk about the Lord and about repentance because the world was crazy in those days. We think the world is crazy now, and it is. Well, I, can't even, I can't even imagine what it was like before the flood. How terrible it was. We think we know terrible? I do not believe we do. We do not know terrible. That God had to wipe out so many people and save only eight out of the whole world. I believe that time there were millions of people. So all the way people were asking, or maybe asking, I'm assuming, but also up to that day, no one knew about that flood until that day when Noah entered the ark, the flood came. And Jesus is saying, say, this is how it will be with the second coming when I come back at the end of the tribulation. Now let's take a look at what preceded uh, the flood. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, we read, because it was so crazy, so terrible, God said, the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal and their days will be 120 years. Now sometimes you know, people uh, try to associate that with the longevity of what they call the pre-flood, the antediluvians, but I think uh, this has to do from this time on, uh, this is the time from Jesus' statement to the flood. This is the time where Noah starts building that ark, and there was a great opportunity for 120 years for people to repent. Question. In fact, in 1 Peter 3.20, as... Uh, Peter sort of reflects on that. He's talking about uh, Jesus is uh, put, being put to death, but made alive in the spirit. And being made alive in the spirit, he went to proclaim to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were do, uh, to those who were, let me back up, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited, waited patiently in the days of Noah. Waited patiently while the ark was being built, and in it only a few people, eight in all. We're saved through water. Wow. In fact, what a comparison today. We read in, in, in Peter, uh, 2 Peter also, uh, God is uh, patient with you, with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to 
repentance. No, oh, see the connection. So during the tribulation at the end of the period, just like the days of Noah, there are those who will not turn, but it will only get worse. Things will get more foul. Just as it was in the days of Noah, where God had to sort of wipe the slate clean. It's interesting, we read in uh, the same thing that will happen uh, during the tribulation uh, days. We read in Revelation 9, The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by three uh, plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur. They came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and their, in their tails, where their tails were like snakes, having heads which with, which with they inflicted injury. It's great tribulation. Did the people repent? The rest of mankind who were not killed by the plague still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons. The idols of gold, silver, bronze, Stone and wood idols that cannot see or hear or walk. And so actually it got worse. And we also read, nor did they repent of their murders, their magical arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. I'll tell you, it sounds like in those days it's going to be unparalleled. And maybe number two, the closest thing to it probably was before the flood. As Jesus is making this comparison. Aren't you glad you're in the church today? Amen. Because there is conversation when that restrainer leaves. And I believe that is the Holy Spirit who is working in, in, through the church. When that church has gone up, we're told that restrainer will be removed. So we read, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. It's the second coming. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And here's the key verse. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came. Now, if Noah went into the ark, they all and his family went, do you think he knew? So who are we talking about? We're talking about the world. We're talking about everybody else. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them, unbelievers, all away. And then Jesus says, this is, or that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. See, let Jesus give the explanation here. We're talking about this revelation. You want to have an understanding? Let, let the author Tell us what the definition is or what it is. Let scripture define scripture and explain scripture. And we know that the first time Jesus came, he came to seek and save the lost. It's the second time he comes as the righteous judge. And just like in Noah and during the time of the flood, there was this cataclysm, a cataclysmic event, a great flood. It killed everyone else. It killed them. It killed they. Because they were taken away in judgment in the flood. Now before this, before this happened, we have Enoch. Number seven from Adam. We have Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalio, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. For every one of them, we read... Let's just say, let's start with Adam. Adam lived, had kids, and died. Seth was born, he, had, he lived, he had kids, he died. Canaan, he lived, he died. He lived, he died. Had kids, they lived, they died. Over and over again, until Enoch. Until Enoch. And this is sometime, sometime before the flood. In Genesis 5, uh, 20, uh, chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, we read, When Enoch had lived 605, uh, let me do this again. When Enoch lived, had lived 65 years, 
That's 365. 365 years. He became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. And I'll tell you, this is where it's at. He walked with God. This goes back right to Adam and Eve in the garden. Because that's what relationship is about. There was this close relationship and fellowship. There was communion with God. There was union with God, a great relationship. It's not religion, it's relationship, right? And we have relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But walking with God, and then we read this. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of, of uh, 365 years. And that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, I, I, we'll, we'll straighten that out. Um, 365 years, I think the first one we had was 300 years uh, when he had sons and daughters. But now we're reading all together. Enoch lived a total of 365 years. That's kind of interesting. It's like one year for every day almost. And pretty much it is. Enoch walked faithfully with God, and then he died. Not exactly. No, he didn't. He, no. Then he was no more because God took him away. <clears throat> we read that he was not. Suddenly unexplained, there was this disappearance, this absence. He was translated. He was moved. It's the same word that is used when God took Adam, took the man, and put him in the garden. And there was the sense that Enoch had been taken away, translated. It sounds like the rapture to me. And I believe this is a preview, a picture of what the church will experience before that great cataclysmic event that seven-year period of tribulation. In fact, the Hebrew writer clarifies the meaning of what we are reading in Genesis about Enoch by adding this. We read, by faith, let me hit it. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not what? Experience death. There you have it. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God because he walked with God. That's why our two-in-one uh, class, uh, walking as Jesus walked, to have that relationship of walking with God. And this is interesting because the Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church. He, he wrote... Uh, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. Or they themselves, who give good report, say that uh, what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and uh, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming what? Wrath. Wrath. From the coming I mean, how can this be possible unless the church is raptured ahead of time? Because the people, those in the, during, the, during the tribulation period, they die. Believers are killed. So back to our text today. Uh, Jesus said, for in the days of, uh, before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying, giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. Uh, they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away in judgment. This is how it will be at the second, uh, at the coming of the Son of Man. They were taken away. That what we call Jesus' second coming, the end of the age. The church is gone. And here's the example and the explanation. He goes into detail. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken in judgment and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken in judgment and the other left. There will be a separation because it is the same as those who were taken away in the flood. Jesus is giving us the explanation and definition. He's going into detail 
Now, not all taken are, are, are the same because it, we're talking about a taken which is good for the rapture when the church goes up. But here Jesus is talking about when he comes in the wrath of God at the end of the tribulation and restores Israel, but also exacts this, this punishment and judgment on the world. This is a different type of taken. This is not the rapture. This is the return of the Lord at the end of the tribulation. And those who are not found in Christ in those days will be separated, taken, taken swept away by judgment, just like the, just like the, like the flood. When Jesus returns, one will be taken away by judgment, the other will be left to enter the kingdom. In fact, uh, Matthew 25, verses 32 and 36, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, we read about the separation of the sheep and goats. Matthew 25, still the Olivet Discourse. As Jesus goes into detail. The ones who are left are Christ's sheep. They know his voice. And so we have these two comparisons. We have the flood and we have the coming of the Son of Man. We have the flood and the coming of the Son of Man and these comparisons. And there's, there's this comparison between two ideas too, and even in Peter. Peter sharing in 2 Peter 2, 4. He said, for if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, that word hell, a lot of times we think it's good. It's not, that, this is Tartarus. It is a place, it's sort of in waiting for a future event, but this is not Gehenna, uh, hell as we know it. It's a place where they're in chains. More like a part of Hades. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to, let's say Hades or to uh, Tartarus, he put them in chains of darkness, to be held for judgment. And here's, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the what? The flood on ungodly people. So we see we're talking about another comparison here. The comparison of flood. Let's take a look at the comparison to the second coming. And we can say just as in the days of Noah, we read that in the last days scoffers will come. This is, about the, this is during the Tribulations. Scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is the coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has from the beginning of creation. We read, Peter writes, but they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, also the world at that time was deluged. This is where we, where we get the word cataclysm or the flood. And destroyed. There's one side of it. But now we look at the comparison as he talks about the future. Peter says, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of what? Judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Future judgment comes by from through the word of God. The same word that cast judgment on, in the flood. Once water, now reserved for fire on the day of judgment. And I'll tell you, this is sobering. And I cannot, I mean, the church is gone. And I, for, the, for the life of me, I, why is it that we, along with generations before us, have, are so blessed, so to speak, every generation from the time of Christ in the church, to be God's people to be, for those who are asleep in Christ, when he returns at the rapture, to be resurrected. And for those of us who are still alive, to be raptured, to meet him in the air, to come alongside of him as his bride. I, I, I don't get that. I mean, this is like too much to take in. We have hope in the rapture. <laughs> And I'll tell you, the martyrdom has started from the very beginning of, in the days of Christ. Has always gone on, and I think for the last last century, the beginning of the century, there has been more and more martyrdom, more people dying for Christ, and we can even we can't even imagine how many have, have died for Christ these days. Brothers and sisters who have experienced martyrdom, I'll tell you, the world is crazy, but it's going to get worse someday. It's going to get worse worse once the restrainer is gone. It's going to be worse once the church is gone. And there will be scoffers following in their own evil desires. And it will be not anything like we've ever experienced. 
during those tribulation times. Kind of like in the days of Noah. With the evil beyond reason. Beyond our reasoning. And again, how fortunate that we should be not suffering wrath. How then should we live? How then should we live? We will be rescued beforehand. The church, the bride of Christ, will be rescued. Do you remember a little soundbite that we had uh, about the difference in the, the, between the rapture and the second coming of Christ? You remember John 14, we said, Jesus said, I'm going to go away. I'm going to prepare a place for you so I can come back to take you with me back to heaven so that you can be with me forever. John, John 14. Remember a little sound bite that helps, at least helps me to, to figure out the difference between the second coming and the rapture. In the rapture, the Lord comes for his saints, right? In the second coming, Jesus comes with his saints. With his saints. Let's, let's see how this plays out in scripture. The for in the rapture and the with in the second coming. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 4.16, kind of familiar. This is when he comes for his saints. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. It's the resurrection for them. After that, we who are still alive and are left to be caught up, uh, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord how long? Forever. That's a long time, isn't it? And this is before the tribulation. The Lord comes for his church. But then he comes back. With, the church comes with him at the end of the tribulation, the second coming, the, day, the end of the age, the day of the Lord. In Revelation 19, we read, I saw heaven standing open before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in what? Fine linen. White and clean. The bride. That is the bride. Just a few verses back. And this is happening right in heaven. This is happening right in heaven. Just a little before these verses. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Who's that? The church, the bride of Christ. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Is that both verses there? Seven and eight together. Okay. Fine linen, bright and clean, were, were given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. This is at the end of the tribulation. She comes with the Lord. The bride comes with the bridegroom. And so we can go back to 14. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in... In uh, fine linen, it's white and clean, verse 15. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword in which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And this is what the church will not experience because the church is not going to experience the wrath of God. Amen. And this idea of the wrath of God, he treads the winepress, is the idea of stopping grapes. There's kind of a violent action. Stopping of grapes is part of the winemaking. And the stains are up to, to the thigh, up to the hilt. The wine press portrays judgment in the second coming. And we read in verse 19, 16. 
on his robe and on his thigh he has the name written. Let's read this one together. King of kings and Lord of lords. King of kings and Lord of lords. As we uh, start to close, um, I'd like to read what Paul wrote in uh, 1 Thessalonians. He wrote, the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, uh, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Well, what, that could be our, uh, <laughs> God's praise for us. Amen, that victory. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell uh, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, who raised, uh, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. How can he do this? How can he? He does this by the rapture. In First Thessalonians 5, verse 1 and 2. Now, brothers and sisters, he's writing to the church. While the times and days we do not need to uh, write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. <clears throat> While people are saying peace and safety... This is a preview. Destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark so that they should prize your lack of faith. We read verses 8 and 9. We jump to 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And then as we close this chapter, he, Jesus, died for us so that we, whether we, well, here it is, whether we are awake or asleep. Sounds like 1 Thessalonians 4, doesn't it? Those who sleep in Christ and those who are, of us who are waiting. And he died for us, whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Just in John 14, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place. I will come back to bring you with me, to take you with me. We read that in Revelation 19, the church is in heaven with God when he returns. They come, the bride comes with him. So that you will be with me forever, Jesus says. Verse 11 Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just in fact, as you are doing. Amen? Amen. Amen.